welcome to Sunday Sermons from the Williamsburg Community Chapel, brought to you by the Chapel Podcast Network. Let's grab our Bibles and open up to the little book of Philemon. It's only one chapter, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 16, and I'll read verses 15 and 16 for us now as we prepare to hear from Dale South as he helps us continue in our Sunday Sermon series titled, Offering. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. 22 sentences, just 335 words. Paul's letter here to Philemon or Philemon or Philemon, if you're speaking Spanish. I got tongue-tied in the first service, went back between Spanish and English. Jeremy uh, Martin says you just call him Phil. I think he's probably, it's probably the safest thing to do. So if I butcher the name going through, it's Philemon, Philemon, uh, same guy. Um, But it's easy to miss this little gem of a letter if you're not reading the Bible straight through or specifically looking for it. And if you are specifically looking for it, you may still have a challenging time finding it because it's just that one little page there right after Titus and right before Hebrews. And I'm convinced, though, that if we miss this little letter and we miss the impact then of a beautiful example of the gospel that is lived out in community. At least Paul's calling them to live it out in community. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity I have to spend two Sundays this week and next week trying to unpack these 335 words in light of their original context. In in the introduction here to the letter, Paul writes that he is a prisoner of Christ Jesus. We'll go into that a little bit more next week. But this letter to Philemon is, is one of Paul's what's called prison epistles. And it's kind of clear as to why they're called that, because it's an epistle or a letter that he wrote while he was in prison. If we look back at it, um, we see in the scriptures, I've got some verses here, uh, Acts 16, we see that Paul was a prisoner in Philippi. Uh, Acts 21, he was a prisoner in Jerusalem. Then also in Acts 21, he was a prisoner in Caesarea. Acts 28, he was a prisoner in Rome. And although we don't have explicit Bible verses and direct uh, evidence here for it, most scholars and other documents lend themselves to give the impression that he was also imprisoned in Ephesus. So we, we, we see this is a letter to Philemon that was also written while he was in prison. The other prison letters are Ephesians, and Colossians, and Philippians, also written from prison. Now, in total... Paul spent about five years of his life in ministry after coming to faith in jails, about half of it in a dungy jail cell, kind of like a dungeony place, and about half of it under house arrest. And we might think that spending so much time in so many jails would damage Paul's credibility. Not exactly the poster boy he might want there to be the gospel representative to the nations, but All of Paul's imprisonments resulted from his willingness to go to places and to go to people who opposed the gospel of Jesus and the church. He wasn't in there because he did anything wrong other than proclaiming the gospel. Now, we've we've said throughout this annual focus, we've got kind of a theme here that says, if you want to know who Jesus is, you need to follow Jesus where he goes. Now, Paul so wanted to follow Jesus that that he was willing to follow Jesus where Jesus went, even when following Jesus led him down a path of beatings, uh, imprisonment, being stoned and left for dead, being shipwrecked, and ultimately to his death as a martyr. Paul's letter then to Philemon is considered a personal letter. Although it was a prison epistle, it's also a personal epistle. And yet it seems that this personal letter was going to be read publicly to the entire church that met in Philemon's house. If you have your passage from the scripture here, you can can look at verses 1 and 2. And in verses 4 through 24, every time you see the word you there, 
It's the singular you. Paul, Paul is addressing Philemon directly here, specifically to him. But in verse 3 and in verse 25, there is a plural you there. Uh, again, we don't, we don't have you all in our, our Bible translations here, but it would be helpful if you did. Uh, this plural you seems to correspond to Philemon's family members who are mentioned, but also to the church that he's mentioned here in, in the introduction. So who, who was this guy, Philemon? Paul calls him a beloved brother. We know that. He was a host at a church in his home. And then most surmise that Aphia was Philemon's wife and Archippus was his son. In verse 5, Paul lauds Philemon for his love, for his faith. He says, Philemon is good to the fellow believers and to the saints. Then again in verse 7, Paul repeats his affirmation of Philemon's love, how it has given Paul great joy and comfort as he has refreshed the hearts of the saints. I mean, this guy seems like it's a really model church member, uh, a, a guy who is the kind of guy that every, every church would probably want to have there. And the fact that Philemon had a house large enough to host a church indicates that he must have been well off financially, had, had a house large enough. So where was this church, though, that Philemon hosted in his home? Um, it, seem, it seems certain that the church at Colossae, or at least part of that church, met in Philemon's house, which is currently part of modern Turkey. Now, those who participated in the 2023 chapel-wide study will recall that we took several weeks going through Paul's letter to the Colossians, and just as a word of information here, this, this year, we keep pushing back our chapel-wide study, trying to find the right context or format for it. So we're going to actually have a reading plan that's going to take us through Lent, starting all of, uh, in February and going through Lent. And then right after Easter, we're going to have the chapel-wide study on the, that corresponds to the discipline of being sent. And it's going to be about how we, we are sent ones going out to share this good news of the gospel. So that will be our chapel-wide study. And looking back at Colossians, though, in chapter 4, verses 7 to 9, if you have your Bibles, I don't have slides today for that. It's, it's not on our sheets. But, but Paul sent a co-worker named Tychicus to deliver the letter, his letter, to the Colossian church. And chapter 4, verse 9 of Colossians mentions another guy with Tychicus. This guy that's with him is named Onesimus. And in those verses, Paul describes Onesimus as our faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. You notice that's the same terminology that he used for Philemon, our, our beloved brother. He's saying the same thing now about Onesimus. And it's almost certain that Tychicus delivered this letter to Philemon along with Onesimus. He probably took the letter to Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon all with Onesimus. Now, Paul presents Philemon as a really loving guy, faithful guy, a man who generously offers what God has entrusted to him. And then after all of that affirmation, Paul kind of sets him up for the big ask here. Uh, Paul makes an appeal to Philemon beginning in verse 8. And that appeal, appeal we're going to see, the, the word appeal is actually twice in the text, is related to Onesimus. This is the guy who delivered the letter from Paul with Tychicus to the church at Colossae and to Philemon. This is the guy that was referred to as this faithful, beloved brother who is one of you. Now, in this current series that we're in, we're considering the discipline of offering. And after commending Philemon for his generous offerings of love, for his generous offering of his material possessions, his offering of his home, Paul now makes a big ask of Philemon to give a different type of offering. Paul asks Philemon to be generous in offering his love and his acceptance to Onesimus. Now, the big idea, it's not super catchy, it's not going to be that easy necessarily to remember, but it's, it's just full of truth. Christians are called to follow Jesus into receiving others who have wronged them. Maybe we want to repeat that. We're going, to, we're going to personalize it a little bit. As a Christian, I am called. As a Christian, 
I am called to receive others who have wronged me. To receive others who have wronged me, right? When it comes to costly acceptance, see, Jesus goes there. If you want to know who Jesus is, you're going to follow Jesus where he goes. That involves following Jesus into costly acceptance, receiving others who have harmed us and have then returned in repentance. Now, we could use the word forgive here, but the Bible doesn't. It's not in this passage. It's actually a word that goes beyond forgiveness. He's actually seen the word koinonia. We'll dig into that next week. It's here twice in the passage. The idea of fellowship, community. It's the result of forgiveness. And the, the NIV then, or excuse me, the ESV, excuse me, translates this word as accept. And it literally means to, to take to oneself to receive hospitably. So Paul has affirmed Philemon for all of his good qualities. And he says, now I've got, got an appeal to you, bud. I, I want you to receive, to take near to you, to draw him near this guy, Onesimus. Give him a hospitable welcome. Now, it's all good. But when we get to verse 15, a couple of things don't seem to line up with what we've learned so far about Philemon and about Onesimus, at least not to me. Uh, these are good guys here, right? But first, we find out that Onesimus was a slave. And then the ESV softens the word to make it servant or a bond servant. I don't want us to miss the impact of this word slave. Um, scholar Murray Harris observes that in 20th century Christianity, we've replaced the expression total surrender with the word commitment. We've replaced the word slave with servant. But there's an important difference because a servant gives service to someone, but a slave belongs to someone. We commit ourselves to do something, but when we surrender ourselves to someone, we give ourselves up. So we see this slave now returning to Philemon. He belongs to someone else that someone else happens to be Philemon, the man we've just seen Paul lauding for his love and his faithfulness. That guy turns out to be Onesimus' owner. And Onesimus is surrendering, turning himself over to Philemon. The second thing that strikes me here as we read on, we, we learn that Onesimus, whom Paul applauds as his faithful, beloved brother who's one of you, uh, he, he wasn't some model slave that had dutifully been serving the one to whom he belonged. Uh, Onesimus, it turns out, was a runaway slave. And it seems pretty clear that he's stolen something from Philemon before he ran away. Now, I want to take just an aside for a moment, because as we're talking about slavery, I want to make sure we're not talking apples to oranges. And I, I, I think just feel in light of our country's history, in light of where we are right now culturally, it's important because a lot of people are going to say, well, if God's support slavery in the Bible, I don't want anything to do with that God. And we need, to, we need to be able to articulate what was actually happening here in the passages. But in light of our country's nearly 250 year shameful history with slavery, to understand what we're reading, we, we need to take a moment to compare and contrast the setting of slavery, which Paul was addressing with the kind of enslaved peoples who landed at Jamestown Island in 1619. You know, those first settlers arrived with this first permanent colony in 1607, which is about 417 years ago. And we have, out of that 417 years, just about 250 years of that was, was chattel slavery. The Bible never endorses slavery. I want to make that very, very clear. However, it does recognize slavery as a re reality in a world that has been very corrupted by sin. God even allowed his own covenant people, the Hebrews, who would become the nation of Israel, to be enslaved in Egypt for 400 years before he rescued and delivered them to freedom, about as long as we've been here since those settlers. God commanded the Israelites to set slaves free every seven years. When Jesus stood in Nazareth in a synagogue in Luke chapter 4, and he's kind of coming out as the Messiah after his baptism. 
and he's asked to read and he stands up and he reads from the scroll in Isaiah chapter 61. Jesus left absolutely no doubt that his kingdom and his mission would ultimately undo slavery. It would ultimately set the captives free. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim fr freedom to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind and to set free the oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that would be the year of Jubilee, the year that all the slaves would be set free. All the debts would be canceled. You see, Jesus mentions even slaves in 13 of his parables but he never does come right out and condemn slavery. Paul instructs slaves in Colossians and Ephesians. He instructs them to obey their masters as if they were obeying Jesus. And yet, in a totally countercultural way, I believe a revolutionary way, Paul also instructs the masters on how to treat their slaves justly because they've been slaves to Christ. And look how your owner Jesus has treated you. See, there had been violent slave revolts before, but Paul was calling for something revolutionary without the violence. The fact that slavery is recognized in the Bible, but is seemingly accepted and never outrightly condemned, it leads many people to question, well, how could God remain silent about such an evil? Yet God and the Bible really do address the issue of slavery. And it is the revolutionary teaching of the Bible that ultimately paved the way for the abolition of slavery. And it was ultimately Christians who followed Jesus as slaves of Christ who led that path. See, slavery took many forms in the ancient world around the time the New Testament was written. And sometimes slaves were prisoners of war who were enslaved by the state and they were condemned to work in mines and public services, often being slaves of Caesar at this particular time. But most of the time, the everyday kind of slavery that most people entered into, uh, it was because people could not pay their debts. For those unfortunate individuals, slavery had nothing to do with the color of their skin. It didn't have to do with their nationality. It didn't have to do with their education level. It, it was all about their indebtedness. There were no bankruptcy courts at the time. If someone couldn't repay their debt, the entire family, including children, could be forced into debt slavery until the debt was paid off by their labor. Look back at Charles Dickens in the debt prisons of England. Still going on in the 1800s there. So... Those in debt just didn't have an option to just go get a new credit card to, to, to sort of shuffle the balances around. They couldn't go down to a payday loan store, which charges exorbitant usury rates, just to have their balance explode with what they still owe. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7 speaks to this reality, and it says, The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is a slave to the lender. Now, some of us here this morning may be trapped, smothering in an avalanche of debt that you just see no way, no hope of getting out of. And if that is you or someone you love, John and Lorraine Perkins are going to be at a small table right out by the desk there by the north entrance, a little, little table with some information about a group that's newly forming, beginning on Monday evenings, the first Monday in March, it uses practices based on biblical principles to become debt-free. The process has helped many, many people get out from under the avalanche of debt. So if you have any questions or even at all remotely interested or think that might be a help to you, see John and Lorraine after the church, the service. Now, getting back to Philemon, in, in Rome at the time, about one-third of the city may have been slaves, Many of those slaves were doctors, professors, administrators, civil servants. You see, even people who have a lot of intelligence and a lot of capacity, and even people who have a lot of material possessions, can get themselves into a big debt hole. And I just want to say, you know, I'm going to probably go home and take a nap after the service. And then I'm going to probably wake up and watch a couple of football games. And 
I, I know that just in a couple of weeks from now, we're going to have the Super Bowl. The only thing we just don't know who's going to be playing. But realize, guys, that that Super Bowl is probably that weekend is one of the very worst weekends in America for human and sex trafficking. It's women are brought in, men are brought in from all over and brought into these areas where tourists and people are going to be going. As we talk about a debt hole, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't just warn each and every one of us here with the pr- proliferation of online betting sites, Fan Kings and, or, or Dra- Draft Kings and FanDuel and MGM and all these betting sites. The, the, the addiction of gambling is just skyrocketed. And, and it will eat you alive. Murray Harris says, sometimes slaves were more highly educated than their owners, and they held responsible professional positions. Some persons sold themselves into slavery for economic or social advantage, but they could reasonably hope to be emancipated after 10 to 20 years of service or by their 30s at the latest. That was the type of slavery that was mostly going on in this New Testament time. In fact, the church father, Clement of Rome, spoke of even many Christians who said, we're going to sell ourselves into slavery to buy food for the poor. Others said, we're going to sell ourselves into slavery to redeem another slave who has family or has a greater need. You see, this kind of debt slavery was deeply ingrained in the whole economic system of the time. And Christians were such a minority that any kind of a direct confrontation would have associated Christians with slave revolts that were violent of the past. Think back of Spartacus. Look him up. It would likely have been a suicide mission for Christians to directly confront and try to eradicate slavery. And it would have damaged the gospel ministry of the church, which was their primary mission. However, there there was one type of slavery practice that was absolutely condemned throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Kidnapping someone to sell them into slavery goes to the very heart of the Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not steal. It's often called man-stealing. And we see that man-stealing in Deuteronomy 24-7 is punishable by the death penalty, totally prohibit among God's people. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, the Apostle Paul is talking to, the, to Timothy there in the church at Ephesus, and Paul reinforced the prohibition of enslavers who kidnap a person to sell them into slavery. Guys, that man-stealing that God in the Bible condemned with the death penalty, that was the kind of slavery that entered America at Jamestown in August of 1619. Not only does the church have to address a slavery problem in the Bible, how do we explain that? We also need to address a Bible problem in our country's history of slavery. You see, Christians took verses and abused and misused them. They took verses that described slavery as being a reality, that that regulated slavery, saying they have to be set free every seven years and you have to treat them as Christ treats you. They, they took those verses, left those verses out of the whole context. They, they ignored verses about man stealing. They ignored verses about being created as a human being in the image of God. They ignored verses about stealing these people and, and selling them into slavery worthy of a death penalty. And they just used the verses that said, slaves obey your masters. Or see, the Bible teaches about slavery. Now, as followers of Jesus today, we, we've got to recognize and lament those sinful atrocities. But we also need to examine ourselves and make sure that we're not misusing God's word in our own lives today, that we're not doing something similar or parallel, that in the events of our day, that we're not using scripture to demean God's image in other people, that we're not using scripture to justify unrighteousness when it may be to our economic benefit. You see, with this as background, to see the different kinds of slavery and what was going on, with with this as background, what we see in these 335 words of Paul's letter to Philemon describe a situation 
but it had to be absolutely uncomfortable and uncertain for everybody involved. Because this outcome of this, his appeal to Philemon to receive Onesimus as you would receive me, it could have been this glorious victory for the gospel on one hand, or if it didn't, it could have blown up and been a disastrous defeat that left the church and people wounded. My imagination may be totally off the wall here, but I can imagine someone going up to Philemon and saying, Philemon, Onesimus is back. And Philemon sees Onesimus, his runaway slave, now back standing in front of him. Onesimus says, hello, sir. I have a letter from you for the Apostle Paul, from the Apostle Paul. And he'd like you to read it, but he'd also like you to read it out loud in front of the whole church that meets in your house. See, awkward doesn't even seem a strong enough word to describe that situation. Paul was asking everybody in this story to take a pretty big risk. See, Onesimus was a runaway slave, and under Roman law, he was worthy of punishment that could range from from beatings to imprisonment, and in rare cases, crucifixion. We, we, We really don't know if Onesimus stole money or objects from Philemon, or if the theft was simply running away before he paid off his debt with his labor. One thing we do know is that neither Paul nor Onesimus could be sure how Philemon was going to respond when Onesimus went and surrendered himself and turned himself over. For Onesimus to return to Colossae and stand before the owner from whom he had stolen was a courageous act of repentance that could have cost him severely. Now for Philemon's part, Paul's request to receive Onesimus back as a brother as if he were receiving Paul, that could not have been easy for Philemon to hear, even if he was reading the letter alone. But to have that read out there in front of the whole church, I mean, awkward. Philemon had already taken an economic hit when Onesimus ran away. Now he had absolutely no guarantee that if he took Onesimus back, that Onesimus wouldn't run away again. Also, Philemon was probably concerned about the message this would communicate to other slaves if he simply overlooked Onesimus' offense and received him back without any kind of punishment. Forgiving and receiving Onesimus back would have been a courageous act for Philemon that could have cost him dearly. Now, Paul himself, right, taking a risk. He was standing between two men whom he had grown to love dearly, both beloved brothers, both faithful men, but who were estranged from one another. Paul's mediation and attempting to find a reconciliation was courageous, and it could have cost him cherished relationships. Even the church members who heard Paul's letter read aloud and witnessed the actions of Philemon and Onesimus, they risked divisions within their fellowship. What might this do to the church if Philemon did not heed Paul's plea? What might happen if Onesimus went off the rails and ran away again? But you know, when you and I turn from our sin and we seek Jesus' forgiveness and acceptance, there's virtually no risk on our part. Jesus has assumed all the risk. He's, he's paid the debt in full. He's willing to receive us. He wants to draw us to himself. He wants to welcome us hospitably. If you've been away from Jesus, just know that that he wants to welcome you. He wants to receive you to himself. He wants you to surrender to him. When we look at this with Jesus, It's not so hard to say, yes, I can repent and go to Jesus. But then when we bring this down to the church on a purely human level, this gets really messy. We have no guarantee of how it's going to turn out if we seek forgiveness and acceptance, whether the other person is going to give it. And then we have no guarantee how it's going to turn out if we offer forgiveness and acceptance. Is the person just going to abuse us all over again? See, the the, the lack of guaranteed good outcomes can scare us off from even trying to live out the gospel as Paul encouraged Philemon and Onesimus and the church to do. Let's get back to the big idea. Christians are called to follow Jesus into receiving others who have wronged them. 
Yes, it can be scary. Yes, it is uncertain. But don't you want to follow Jesus like that, to know him like that? Don't you want to be a part of a church that behaves like that? In response to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us this morning, I encourage you to ask the Lord this week and some time alone with him. Lord, is there anyone I've wronged and run away from that I need to return to and seek restoration, reconciliation? Lord, is there someone that has come back to me seeking my acceptance, asking for forgiveness, repenting, but I've not been ready to give it? Or, Lord, do I have fellow believers whom I love, both of them or all of them, but they're estranged from one another? How might I encourage them to reconcile as Paul did with Philemon and Onesimus? Hope you're here next Sunday. I hope to look further into these same 335 words to see the power of the beautiful gospel of Christ. Give us the courage and the motivation to do what is uncertain and scary as we follow him into costly forgiveness and acceptance of those who may have wronged us. Thank you for joining us today. Here at the Williamsburg Community Chapel, we are all about making disciples of Jesus Christ. So wherever you are on your spiritual journey, we hope you will take up this call of Jesus to follow me as we consider these disciplines for disciples.